recently a query was put as to the nature and the condition of all that would be considered the natural kingdom in the form of the fairies and all those who interact with nature as they do. The question was put forth by one expressing concern for these, concern for this kingdom, perhaps based upon the nature of climate change and all that surrounds these issues, based upon the fires, the floods, and the general changing conditions around the planet. So we will dedicate this discussion to these beings, honoring them as we do for the work that they do and for the relationship that they have established with all beings and all things. In order to cover subject then thoroughly, we must say, describe, define a little bit the nature of these beings so that you will know more about what they are. Indeed, they are a very important part of nature itself. What you consider fairies are not always such gentle folk. In fact, they are an aspect of nature itself. They are a kingdom unto themselves, not simply what you consider fairy, but all those that connect one realm of nature with another, one dimension with another, one kingdom to another. And that is their purpose, to define it in the most general terms. They, like the connective tissue in your body, connect all things to themselves and to each other. Without these forces of nature, a rock would not necessarily be able to lie comfortably in your garden next to a plant. Truly, I would say to you, the plant would not grow in the soil. Even if there were the perfect mineral content in that soil, it would not grow. Why? Because that which you would consider the fairy realm is the connective tissue that says to the plant, what is the nutrition that is in the soil? How much? where to place the root. It guides the root, the little tentacle of the root, deeper into the ground where the richer minerals are. That is their purpose. It allows all of nature to function better, more properly. It allows nature itself to understand itself, its relationship to all of its separate aspects. So within your body, for instance, there are aspects of the body, the intelligence of the body, the body elemental itself, that connects all of the separate aspects and says to each one, this is your function. It is your function, not because you are an individual, but because you are part of something larger, something more whole, something more perfect. Because you are needed, because you are wanted, because with this understanding... Now, matter is not, in this case, whether this takes place at the conscious or the unconscious level. Humanity at times becomes very concerned with this subject and understood, because humanity is seeking its own discovery now. It is giving birth to itself, to its own consciousness. And so it assumes that all other aspects, all other things, all other beings are doing the same. Well, yes, to a certain extent it is true, but not in the most complete sense. You see, there are aspects of nature that are just that, and quite content to be just that. Using again the example of your body, your heart is content to be your heart. It does not seek to rearrange itself, or if it understood itself more completely, it would then choose to be brain. See? 
It is content understanding itself, its purpose, fulfilling that purpose to the best of its ability, to the highest of its ability. And so much of nature is that way as well. Much of Gaia is that way as well. You see, you may ask Gaia, sentience, wouldn't you rather be the sentience of a more evolved planet? Wouldn't you rather be the sentience of Jupiter since it is so much larger? Well, no, you see, because the sentience of all that is the natural realms of the earth, that is my purpose. That is my love. That is my challenge. That is my discovery. That is what I am, what I seek, what I have found, what I live. And in the way that a sentience can be content, which is not the same as happy, Gaia is that which Gaia is, perfectly content, regardless of what is taking place upon the earth, which is another subject altogether. Now, these aspects of nature, as we speak about them, it is the same with these. So, for instance, a fairy does not seek to be an angel. It is quite content understanding what it is and how it is. And so, to better describe it then, a fairy is a being which is an act of nature. It belongs to the natural realm. To those that personify it, well, so be it. But I tell you that a fairy does not look like a little child. However, it is quite innocent in its makeup. It is quite perfect. It is perpetually young because it is always renewing itself. It renews itself in the day. It renews itself within the elements themselves. It renews itself season by season and year by year. And so, yes, to you a fairy would appear very innocent, very young, always renewing itself. This is one reason that artists often depict them this way. Often, as you have seen, they have also been depicted with wings. Well, this has more to do with their transformative state. Remember that I have said to you that they bridge all gaps between the kingdoms and between the thoughts, the mental thoughts or processes between one aspect of nature and another. And because they have the ability to, yes, transform a thought, a reality or even one kingdom into another when need be. They are depicted in the magical realm, thought to be part of the realm of magic or fantasy. They are no more fantasy than you are, I assure you. There is a truth about them, a depth, a profundity that would astound you. They are wise. Truth be taught, they would belong to the kingdom of wisdom, the kingdom of the earth that is and knows wisdom in all instances at all times. Now, what is their environment then? How does a fairy live? Again, I tell you that a fairy is not a little being, but it is a beingness. It is an energy. It is an aspect of nature. It is a spark of creation connected to all other sparks. In essence, the fairies are to the earth what the stars are to the sky as you view them. What would be the dark night sky without a twinkling light? Would it be only darkness then, if you could not imagine all the stars and whether they be planets or how far away they would be? The stars are for you an opportunity to connect the dots one to the other, connecting your thoughts to them. They assist your imagination to expand. And when you look up, you also look out. You also look in. And because of the depth 
of space and the stars that are held there, suspended there for you to view, you are taken further in to your own being. So they assist you even in that way. Well, the fairies belong to the realm or the net, the weaving of energy of the earth that does the same. They belong to a weaving of nature as well. So imagine that, a very fine weaving, horizontal, vertical, diagonal, layers of light, layered, placed, ever so carefully, one atop another, beside another, connecting all things to themselves and to each other. This is how life on earth is truly. Life upon the earth is layered ever so gently, layer upon layer. Now imagine, if you will, and you do, that there are cities beneath the surface of the earth, and then there are many different layers or strata of earth, and then there are many different ways in which humanity makes itself upon the earth as well, from those that dwell in caves to those that would prefer to dwell in the high rises of the skyscrapers. If you can think of all of these as layers in which people live differently, arranged differently by their own thoughts, by their own ideas and ideals of life, this is what the fairy kingdom does as well. It allows all of this layering to take place. It is the glue, if you like, that holds the joints together where the layers intersect, and there are many places where they do. So imagine now that not only is life layered very finely in this way, but at every intersection there is an intersection of dimension as well. So not simply the ability to go here or there, but the ability to move truly from one place to another, dimensionally speaking. This ability then to transcend or to transform one into another, one almost anything into another is the gift of this kingdom. It remakes life as one understands it. They move in and without gravity, pulled to the earth, yes, as you are, but without the necessity of density, without the necessity to be held or pulled to the ground. And so, yes, they appear to walk upon the ground very lightly, walking upon the earth ever so lightly, not leaving footprints. Their blueprint, then, is one that is of architecture. They are architectural giants, they are creative manifestations of nature. And so before you become enamored of a small and tiny filament of light, sweet and cute. Before you allow yourself to be entrapped by that, for indeed it is an entrapment, let you instead consider the greatness that is nature itself. Consider the kingdom of nature and how great it is, how powerful it is. And consider that there is light, filaments of light belonging to nature itself that carry nature's intelligence. And so these beings are not physical and they are not not physical. They are manifestations of light. How does light manifest? Well, it can become quite dense and so it would appear to be a physical manifestation. Or it can remain as light and shadows in the greys of life, undulating forward and backward, watery in the ways that it is. Nature manifests, makes itself, remakes itself, 
tears itself down in order to remake itself again. And so all to do with this kingdom does the same. All of the beings associated with the kingdoms of nature have the ability to break down nature, to rebuild it. To rebuild it for one season or many seasons only to tear it down and away, to break it down component by element, to reduce it to dust only to begin again. The kingdom, then, of the fairies is one that allows life to continue. This kingdom is responsible for the continuity, the fluidity of life, all of life. They are concerned with the greatness that is the earth in all of the ways that the earth manifests now and into the future. So you see how these great and powerful beings bring about the world that you live in, the world that you know, assisting in maintaining it, encouraging all things to grow, and all things to remake themselves in their highest form as well. This kingdom, then, is the earth. It is the glue or the magic that brings all the kingdoms together into one. When you say the earth or when you say Gaia, it is the same as to say this force, this energy. When you say the power of nature, it is these beings that hold or bring or encourage that power. So before you consider what a sweet little character this or that has been depicted, look to the force behind that. Look to the task that is maintained then. Here then we speak of all of the elements, earth and water and fire and air, and certainly you have seen the very power of all of these elements individually as they bring about their highest forms, their gentlest forms, and as well their most destructive. It is these beings then that understand that force. How to honor it, how to use it, how to diffuse it. I could tell you, for instance, that humanity would be unable on its own to put out a fire without this aspect of nature, without this intelligence. The act of putting out a fire, or of building one to maintain one's warmth, requires more than the elements themselves. There is an intelligence to each kingdom, to each element. There is something that must bind one to the other. What is it that binds wood to air so that when ignited, the oxygen then feeds the flame? You see, it is not simply an act of the scientific principles between the two. There is a thought process. There is an intelligence that makes this so. Even when the rains come, torrential rains, they are accompanied by an intelligence. They are an act of nature. They are a force of nature. Does this mean that the fairies, for instance, on their own, could decide when to start a rain or cause it to cease? No. Remember that they are not individual beings. They are part of nature itself. They are the face, the intelligent face of nature, the communicative face of nature. That which binds the elements to a higher truth or a higher purpose. Well, if they only then ever had anything to do with humanity, how is it that they came to be so endeared, so favored by humanity? Well, 
In essence, humanity has turned to the forces that it has least understood. Humanity has turned to nature, has turned to the magic within nature. Long ago and from the very first time that it saw fire come forward, that it has seen rain come from the skies, meteors to touch the earth, Sunshine eclipses all that has been not understood, little understood by humanity. Long and longer ago, it was assumed that it came about by some magical principle beyond comprehension. Something or someone. Of course, as we have delved into parts of your histories, there have been times in your own historic perspective, where humanity has been encouraged to think of itself as less, as less intelligent, as less desirable, as less needed to the earth. All of this, then, this thought process, feeding one generation after another eons and eons ago, humanity came to only trust those things that it could control because as you might imagine it came to know as well that some thing or some one was controlling or influencing it as well and so while there was a time where humanity could easily see between the veils, between the layers and the dimensions that we have described, to see what rests there, what is active there, what is the active principle in nature. There came a time when humanity's thoughts, the mental process, became somewhat divorced from the kingdoms of nature. Humanity separated itself from nature. Why? Well, for the simple reason that it had been dominated by this or by that or by they for some time. And when there came a time of great rest, when this was not the case, then humanity began to look about its world and see how to dominate it. You see, in essence, it simply followed the example that had been shown to it. Do unto others, if you like. And so if another controls or dominates, then humanity set about to do the same. The stronger one or the smarter one, or what it would be. Well, the only thing that humanity could dominate was the seen realm because at that time it did not have the ability other than for a very few individuals it did not have the ability to see any longer between the layers between the places and so it came to trust those things that it could see and touch and feel and command humanity then took it upon itself to command all those things that it had strength over or resolve over. But as you have well seen, matters not how many eons of time have passed since then to now, humanity does not have command over nature. Still, humanity believes that nature has command over it, and that is not true either. So, for a very long time, it has endeavored, then, to command or to subjugate nature, to build in such a way as nature could stay out, to build in such a way that would not take into consideration the flow of a mighty river, the coastline of a continent, how deep to dig, how high to build. No, humanity would command its world, would take it upon its own to make its compromises by taking what enterprises 
it saw fit. And so if a kingdom needed to be displaced, well, so be it. Not enough sand on the beach, let's bring some from elsewhere. Let's bring this animal or take it away and relocate it. All things physical that humanity could command, it did. And it has. Well, in some ways that has worked to its favor, but not in all ways. And particularly then now, at a time when there is a change, not only in seasons, but a change upon the earth as it adjusts itself from one age to another in a very natural process. So the earth now, all that it is doing, is adjusting itself, readjusting, re-establishing the place that each kingdom holds. It is nature retaking, remaking, rebalancing the earth. Not because it rebels against humanity or to castigate humanity for the decisions that it made, of course not. Humanity has commanded to the best of its ability. It has been a steward to the best of its ability. But where that ability has not taken the highest or the best route, well, it falls upon the kingdoms of nature to reclaim that, to reestablish that. And that is what is taking place now. Therefore, climate change then be no more than the process of readjusting the elements and the kingdoms to a more natural state given the consciousness, the conscious rise of the planet. Just like the ocean floor must resettle itself at times, remake its composition, so must humanity now as well readjust itself to what the earth is adjusting. You see, it is your planet. It is nature's planet too. It is your home. It is also nature's home. It is also Gaia's home. It is the future home of other kingdoms and other generations and other beings. So it is time to remake in the name of one in the name of unity. So what is the purpose then? What is taking place within the kingdoms of fairy? Well, busyness. Much as in your own realm. The day is busy. It is non-stop, if you like. It is time to reweave the layers of life, to reconnect the tissue, the elements of life, but perhaps in a slightly different way. The web of life, it is being remade, it is being honored once again. One aspect is reaching for the next. In order to do this, some things must be made and others unmade. Some aspects must be connected, others reconnected, some disconnected. In order to have resonance, one must recognize where is the dissonance. And so now you have this kingdom alive, enlivened, awakened, and working in your favor, in favor of the earth, in favor of every kingdom as well. This kingdom is also well known for bridging together dimensions, bridging together realities and truths. Now, what is this being then? Again, I tell you, it is a filament of light, a spark of life itself. It is a mental thought that has become so active, so agitated, that it can be seen in a beam of light. It is a reflection of itself. So are there those that can see fairies then? Well, yes. 
there are those that can. How to, then? Well, you must, in essence, accelerate your ability to see. You must accelerate your own vision so that the light filaments that pass before your eyes dance, so they are agitated in the same way that they become very agitated when you stare at the sun. And you cannot do it for very long. It would be the same to look upon this force of nature. For a moment you would see something that is not there, except that it is there, or at least it was there. Now when you open your eyes or shift, but for a moment again, why is it no longer there? Well, in essence, because these light filaments move that fast. It is rare that you would see it in the same place for more than an instant. It is energy that moves. It weaves. It is just the layer between something. Have you taken the time to study the gap between one word and another when you see it printed upon the page? No. Because you are more concentrating upon the words themselves, how they come together, how they form sounds, what is the context with which they have been written, what is the general meaning that is being conveyed, how is the thought then carried, how is it to be communicated from one to another. In all of this that you consider, there is something that holds all of it together that you could call syntax or logic or what you will. Well, nature has this as well. It is able to connect and to reconnect, to divert, to engage. That is what these kingdoms are busy doing now, in your honor, in your favor. Now I tell you with certainty that you need have no concern that this as a being or as a species has any thoughts whatsoever regarding whether you have done a good job with the planet or not, whether you have helped or harmed the planet. There is no concern in this regard. You see, there is no emotion. There are mental processes, processing all of the time. Now, to put it in a rather blunt fashion, for instance, your computer is busy processing all of the queries that you have, all of the demands that you make upon it, fetching this and delivering that and storing the other. It does not have the time to consider whether any of your requests are well-founded or recognized or logically organized or like that. Its function is to do your bidding and to bring about the highest and quickest result. So it is the same with this kingdom, you see? It is its job to do nature's bidding, to quickly weave, shift, change, make, create, destroy, rebuild, or what is necessary in order to bring about the next instant to the highest, the best. It will heal when it is important to heal. It will slice through stone, if need be, for the next higher purpose or the next higher truth. Again, at this particular time in history, at this particular moment in time, all of the kingdoms of nature, of which humanity is one as well, are making and remaking the earth from a higher perspective. That you cannot see this in every instance or in every moment, be it have no concern upon you, as we have just said. How often do you pay attention to the rare gap between the words? You see, you have your own movement, you have your own purpose, and for the most part it does not take place by examining where every aspect of life is layered or where every crossroad is between one reality and the next. Truth be told, it is quite difficult for humanity to find itself to the other realities, for the most part because it has a stronger belief system than the other kingdoms or the other species as well. 
You have been taught to believe something about yourselves, to believe something about life. As you believe this or that then, there are many other things that become the opposite of that or something that you would non-believe. It would not enter your realm. It would not enter, as you say, your realm of the imagination. But you see, that is what these beings do all of the time. Imagine the next reality and build it. Imagine the next form and create the mental processes, mental thought forms by which the formless can take form. All of this then belongs to the earth. They belong to the earth, to the higher truths and to all that is well upon the earth as well. A good question be put then, do the other kingdoms of the earth recognize, for instance, would a wolf recognize a fairy? Well, to some degree, yes. To a certain extent, it would. When the wolf, then, brings about its highest perspective, then it blends with other aspects of nature. For instance, imagine that a wolf, then, is finding for itself a safe den by which to birth its pups. Now it has become part of the next layer of life. You see, the next generation of life is about to be born. So it is not now a wolf, then, maintaining its own safety or the next secure meal for the day. Now its purpose is greater. Now it must blend itself with other aspects, with other kingdoms. Now it requires certain exact plant material, a safe place by which to hide, to veil itself and its pups in safety, and all else by which to give them both succor and strength. And so the wolf then becomes part of a higher moment or a higher perspective. What is it that allows it to do that? Is it its own instinct? Yes. But what makes, what refines that instinct? You see, there is a place by where instinct meets intuition. A very pure place where nothing else exists but the thought form between the earthiness of instinct and the pureness of intuition. The kingdom dwells there the highest moment, the next moment, the next generation, the next layer of life is there. And so the wolf then interacts with this layer for those moments. Now put yourself in the position of the wolf for a moment. If you had access to this layer, to this realm, oh, how you would cling to it. Let me stay, let me stay you would say. But the wolf makes no attempt to do that. For the wolf, it is well and good to say, I have reached the state that I have come. Life and I have become one, and the next generation is birthed, and then instinct takes over again. So the wolf would make no particular gesture to hold that place or to maintain that placeless place as humanity would. It does not cling to that aspect of nature because it trusts that its own instinct will bring it to that place or to that threshold at any other time in any other moment. See the difference then. Humanity does not yet trust that place. It is not certain of its own instinct or whether to trust its own instinct, much less that of another. It has an idea of intuition and how moments of brilliance come from that direction. But it does not know how to access that on an ongoing basis 
or how indeed to trust that an intuitive moment is an illuminated one, a more valuable one. And so again, it falls upon what it trusts, what it can see, what it can touch, what it believes that it knows. And so the intelligence of the unknown, once again, is put behind or beside. The greater part of the trust comes from the feeling, touching, seeing world. This makes the kingdom that we have been speaking of not only considered invisible or magical, but even that much more important, you see. Because it or they do not depend upon humanity's belief, acknowledgement, or participation in anything that is needed. Though humanity be one of the greater kingdoms of the earth, in this regard it is yet still somewhat backward in the process. But matters not. You are growing, and soon you will see those things that come from the earth and how intelligent and bright they are, and those things that come from the stars and how intelligent and bright they are, and how they are truly one, how they are inseparable from each other, how above is as below. In the meantime, we have the benefit of these particular beings, and it is fortunate for the earth, fortunate for all upon the earth, that this intelligence, that this brilliance has already seen the next moments of the earth. So what appears to be invisibly making itself problematic to the earth where humanity is concerned, I tell you that it is not so. There is a greater intelligence at work in the earth, upon the earth, at every layer, at every juncture, in every dimension, in every corner, in every species, and that these beings, aware of all things, including climate, are already far and away ahead of all things, planning, moving, shifting. Know that they are aware of the movement of the ice caps. They are aware of the death of several coral colonies and what will be needed to reignite or regenerate these. They are aware of the seas, which ones are alive and which ones are dying. And this intelligence has the ability to take certain kelp beds that are very, very alive and to carry them to places of birth. Imagine that. Imagine that the ocean has its own nurseries already where great and specific forms of energy that will later travel to all of the oceans are being incubated at this very moment. Know that these beings understand the very content of the ash that is left, either from the volcano that has erupted or from the fire that has raged. But they are able to distribute these by the element of air to where it is most necessary, to where it will fall deep into the soil where it can be absorbed, where all of the necessary nutrients again could be carried from one continent to another so that forests will be able to remake themselves, regenerate themselves even after great fires have raged. These beings understand then the mineral content of the earth 
how to combine and recombine these elements in such a way not only to bring about balance but at a certain time and place to suggest themselves to humanity that of course will then say look what I have discovered and look what it can do and might I patent it please well as you can see to this kingdom a patent matters little and nothing so wherever possible then to those that would seek communication with this well it can be it can be but do not then imagine a tiny little being resting upon your shoulder looking ever so wistful and sweet dressed in a tiny thimble of light instead imagine yourself coming into contact with a great current a great current a wave of energy that washes over you and says I am the face of nature I am life I am the giver of life and I give it to you I bring it to you I lay it before you and if possible let your self think in these terms as well do not think to yourself I am one of humankind I am one human being one man one woman with a small purpose and a limited amount of years to live upon the earth no you too are a great being at an intersection of life and light at a perfect moment of destiny at the completion and inception of the next cycle a force of nature an act of purpose greatness unfolding divulging its secrets to itself and to others let you think of yourself as the marriage between here and there a truth coming forward let this particular time then favor you be favorite of life yes look round you in all of your human perspective and all of your human tasks look beyond it as well look between that as well look to the great continuity of life itself to the great unfoldment to the unfoldment of nature revealing its secrets to you and it will it will do you wish to be part of the greater whole do you wish to know the secrets that the earth holds it is not simply in moments such as this that I will unveil them to you or bring them forward for you to study as if they were a case study in a book in moments such as this sweet ones I lay the earth at your feet I bid you partake of every element and the wisdom that it offers look forward look to your future do not imagine it as more of your past do not little yourself by thinking that tomorrow ought to look anything like what yesterday looked like why should it let nature reveal itself to you its wisdom its intelligence its forces they are not simply outside of you or acting upon you or directing your day it is not simply a rainy day that says better great your umbrella it is a force of nature that says you are this you are also this 
You are part of this greatness. You are made in this element. You are made in this image. This is your earth. This is your tomorrow. Dance with this idea then. Dance with this thought. The layers are remaking themselves now. For some have become so, so thin that as you might imagine they cannot, should not, be repaired. And so those particular elements, or the shreds that are left of that particular element, well, they will be returned to the earth in the way that they are, to remake themselves. That skin has already been shed, or is in the process. And the next one comes forward. So it is the next layer now the next opportunity, the next dance, the next cosmic event, the next unfoldment, and you are a part of that. Perhaps it would surprise you if I were to say to you that on other worlds, on other planets, some of the young children the younger beings ask, and whatever became of humanity upon that far and distant place, the earth, are they still there? Are they still doing what they were doing? Have they learned? Have they grown? Can we visit? I remember them. What are they like now? You see? In some ways, humanity is one part oddity, at least as far as others that view you from distant places are. But there is a curiosity about you. And others truly have a desire to see what you will make, what you will do, what you will do next, what you will discover about yourselves and your world how you will retool yourselves, retool your world, your purpose, the earth. And so, yes, there is a natural curiosity, not only on your part for what takes place in other realms, in other dimensions, or in other worlds, but on their part where you are concerned. Hmm. Well then, as I have piqued your curiosity and brought the kingdoms closer to one another, the elements closer to one another. I leave you with that. I would encourage you, I would beseech you. Do not see yourself as separate. You are not separate from the home that you live in. You are not separate from your neighbors or your families, regardless of how distinct you imagine yourself to be, how separate your mental processes, your visions, your ideas your opinions and judgments. You are of the same kind, refining, one thought at a time, one beat of the heart, one lifetime. It is your world, sweet ones. Rather than own it or control it, create it, create with it. Blend, blur, receive. Until the next moment, I bid you good day.